The Secret Library Podcast is brought to you in part by our amazing Patreon members. If you want to support the show for as little as $1 a month, you can get solo episodes and updates from inside my writing process at patreon.com slash secret library. Another fun announcement, I am currently accepting new individual clients to start working with me in March. If you've been wanting some one-on-one support in your writing life, coaching might be just the ticket. So you can book a consult with me at secretlibrarypodcast.com slash consult so we can chat for about 30 minutes and learn more about what's going on with you and how I can support you in moving forward. This is the Secret Library Podcast, and my guest this week is Sarah Jane Stratford, who's the author of four novels, most recently Radio Girls and Red Letter Days, which is out this week. Sarah Jane grew up in Los Angeles with a deep love of theater and literature. After earning a bachelor's degree in history at UC Santa Cruz, she then obtained a master's degree in medieval history at the University of York in Britain, where she wrote a thesis about women in the manorial court system, which gave her a whole new appreciation for the modern era. Sarah Jane has written articles and essays for a range of publications, including The Guardian, The Boston Globe, The Los Angeles Review of Books, Mary Claire, Bitch, Slate, Salon, Guernica, Bustle, and Balm. She was recently awarded a Tier 1 Highly Talented Visa by the Arts Council in Britain, granting her leave to live and write in the UK for five years. She currently lives in London. So I was very excited to see that there was another book coming out from Sarah Jane because I enjoyed Radio Girls so much, so I snatched at the opportunity to get Red Letter Days early and to chat with her because her books are so historically focused in terms of era and situation and the entire plot basically hinges on historical eras. So what does that do to your revision process? Also, I wanted to talk to someone who was actually trained as a historian as to how that informed the revision process and still ended up with a highly readable book. Both of these books are really fun to read, yet you feel really immersed in the historical setting. So I was very happy that Sarah Jane wanted to come on. So we'll be talking about history, how history impacts your revision process, and a whole lot more in this episode. I really hope you enjoy it. You can get notes, links, and more information from this episode and sign up for footnotes, weekly letters about writing to your inbox at secretlibrarypodcast.com. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, Sarah Jane, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me. So as we're talking about revision this season, I particularly was happy to talk to you because you have such um, a historical and complex backdrop to your book, Red Letter Days. So I wanted to make sure that we talked to someone who had to do a lot of historical research and was also doing something fairly complicated, which is that you have characters that are based on historical figures, but you've diverged a bit in order to get on with writing a novel. So I'm interested Mm -hmm. in how you made that decision and how you struck that balance between really capturing the essence of the historical time, which you did, and then also still having characters um, that feel alive to you as the writer. It's funny because I don't actually remember making a conscious decision. It was more as, as I was working, as I was developing the characters, And of course, I had done research into uh, the real characters' lives. And it it just started to feel um, a little stifling. Whereas in my in my previous book, Radio Girls, I tried very hard to adhere to, you know, all as, as many facts of the real characters' lives as possible. And and that worked very well for that novel. But for this one, because thematically it was going in a slightly different direction i just i needed the freedom to step away from the real in this case hannah weinstein's life and fictionalize her um just so that i could do more with her emotionally as someone who you know have two degrees in history i'm you know very uh very persnickety <laughs> about <laughs> A historical accuracy, you know, so I, there's the part of me that says, wow, that's lazy. But in fact, it was just something that felt so natural and ultimately made her more real for me 
as I continue to develop her on the page. I think it's such a nice solution because usually what I've seen is that you either have a historical novel that really, really stays as close as possible to every single historical detail as you can, or you have, you know, completely fictionalized characters in a setting. And sometimes you'll have both, you know, working together in the same book, um, which I think works nicely. But I haven't, I haven't seen this kind of middle way, which is really exciting because I've always felt whenever I've wanted to get into a historical story and write it, that those are my only two options. I either had to really write the historical character like I was a historian, stick to every possible detail, or I had to make somebody else up completely differently. But this hybrid feels really satisfying, actually. It, 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 it very much was. Well, it's funny because... For Red Letter Days, I, I did something that really I've never done before, which is I I came to the story through the um, the historical incident of the blacklist, whereas previously it's always a character mm. who begins. So in the case of Radio Girls, it was that I was doing research and you know I just happened to be combing over like women in journalism in the 1920s, as you do. <laughs> and I came upon Hilda Matheson and said, oh, my goodness, who who is she? And the more I read about her, the more I said, oh, my goodness, who is she? And why don't I know about her? Why doesn't anybody know about her? So, you know, that's that was my window into developing that book. But in the case of Red Letter Days, I started thinking about the blacklist and, you know, it's impossible, I think, to read history and not think, yes, but who isn't being talked about? And that's especially true when we think about women, because, you know, primarily women are written out of history, or at least this is not even deliberate. It's just they're not usually included. And so when we think about the Hollywood blacklist, but we think about the Hollywood 10. And of course, they were all men. But the blacklist went on for years. And um, quite a number of women were added to it and, you know, lost their livelihoods, much the same as the men, but they're, they're not really talked about. And I started thinking, well, who who were they? And what happened to them? And that's when I started doing more research. And that's when I found Hannah and, you know, got got started really writing. But uh, initially, I was thinking more about fictional characters, because I was thinking, well, what would happen to someone, especially if she weren't rich or famous, terribly successful, you know, a working writer, but, you know, not someone doing particularly brilliantly? And what would happen to her? Yeah, this was really the central pull through the story is I think that while Hannah is the backdrop, we really we follow Phoebe, who's the mm-hmm. working writer from the beginning. We see Phoebe. Phoebe has a, a tricky life. She's in a lot of tricky situations that she has to balance. And then we follow her through. I'm curious, just in terms of a draft by draft process, how much did you know about these two characters' stories at the end of the first draft? And how much, you know, what were you thinking about in your first draft versus what you added in or revised or, or handled in later drafts? I'm curious about how it all came together. Right. Um, I mean, I very much adhere to the Anne Lamott theory of the, the shitty first draft. Yes. And I just... You know, or or who is it who also refers to the vomit draft? Oh, I haven't um, heard that one. I love just, that. I love that, exactly. Um, so I just had to get everything out. And I mean, I would say virtually half of what I wrote in the first draft ended up just being junked. Because, yeah, it was really once I got to the end that I felt, OK, now I'm ready to begin. And seeing just how they handled situations um, because there were ways in which I thought of this book as being a bit like a thriller and it it was initially going to be uh, different. I I mean, the ending was completely different. Um, It was arguably it was darker. Um, 
and 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 then as I continued to revise, and especially once I was working with my editor, yeah, you know, we we shifted gears, and she said, you know, I don't think this is what Phoebe would do. And initially, I I, I railed against that, but then I looked and said, oh, you're right. I mean, this is why we love editors because they they tell us things we don't always want to hear, but you know, nine times out of ten, they're right. <laughs> Uh, and the characters, of course, you know, begin to tell you things as well. I did probably more with her relationship than I would have, which may or may not be because I started a relationship about halfway through the writing of the book. Oh, how fun. Uh, yeah, it <laughs> worked out really well. Um, and and then there were things like I have um, a fairly significant child character, and I based that a lot on my friend's daughter, but it was because of you know, observing her and listening to her um, as I was working. I'm like, oh, that's that's such a funny, that's such a very specific thing that only a five year old would do or say. And I have to I have to include that in some way. It's interesting how this happens where, you know, there's an idea for a book, whether that's a situation like the Hollywood blacklist or a character. And then you get in and you at least I do, you put everything into this first draft of, of all the things you can imagine. But then I think going into the second draft, there are these things like a friend's child or a circumstance that changes in your own life that it does manage to filter into the book. Did it change? Um, had you moved to England while writing this book or were you writing it still living elsewhere? Uh, so that was another thing why it also took me much longer to write is because, yeah, I was about a third of the way through when I moved from, I I was living in New York and then I uh, went to LA for a few months. Uh, that's where my mother lives. And yes, then I moved to London about a third of the way through writing the book. And that will slow you up a lot more than you think it might. Oh, I know. I know this well. <laughs> So, I mean, it was wonderful. And of course, it, it did completely change the energy of the work and the story. Because um, I had done a degree in the UK, and I've spent a lot of time in the UK over the years. But to actually be living here, yeah, it, 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 it really gave everything a slightly different tinge. And and that was wonderful because it was it was exciting to walk around where the characters would have walked, like really spend time, not just on a research trip, but to actually be immersed in it and feel every day as I'm taking the bus like, oh, you know, yeah, Phoebe would have seen that. It's it's fun, but it's also it, it did mean that, yes, I ended up throwing out then yet more because of the other things I felt, okay, well, you know, I have to add this or uh, that just doesn't, that doesn't now fit. It's interesting because one of the things I think is fascinating is the ability to put your own emotional experience into a book, even something that's happening in a completely different time period, in a completely different circumstance. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, here's a writer writing a book about a writer who moves from New York to London may have mixed feelings about doing so. Obviously, you probably weren't running from a subpoena, but um, well, <laughs> well, we're not going to tell that one for the public. <laughs> but that there's this ability to to look at a, you know a completely different life in a completely different time period, and yet pull from that emotional experience. Did you find that you did that a lot in looking at? Okay, I had this life before in New York. I'm in London now. Or was Phoebe's experience completely different than yours? Um, it was a bit of both. Uh, I mean, sort of to backtrack a bit, one of the ways I even began thinking about the blacklist uh, was because I'd been stuck for a new idea, um, which often happens happens to me just after something comes out. It, it just takes a while to start um, getting the creative juices flowing again. and And then the 2016 election happened. Yeah. And like a lot of people, initially, I just felt, I don't even know how to start processing this as, as a person, as a writer. But then gradually, I, I started thinking about, well, 
what are some other times when the country was not at its best, shall we say? Mm -hmm. And and of course, I did immediately then come to the blacklist. And so, so in a way, um, I feel like yes, that's that's how you know, Phoebe and I are, and and Hannah, you know, we all kind of converge because I certainly didn't leave. America because I felt that I had to. I, I it was something I very much wanted to do. I'd been planning it a long time, but then I felt considerably less sorry to do so for a little while, um, and I had mixed feelings about that. But you know, but yes, it was it wasn't the same as feeling like I need to get out, or everything in my life is going to be compromised. And for Phoebe in particular, one of the things I really wanted to get into is, you know, it's not just the fear, but it's things like the loneliness, um, particularly because in that time, she would have known almost nothing about England, London, what she knew, she knew, you know, from cinema, uh, radio, you know, just popular culture, but it's not the same as you know, how we live now with social media and, well, just so much media. So the level of the foreignness you would have been such that not only was she first made to feel like, no, you no longer belong in your own country, you know, then she gets to this new place and says, I, I just don't even know where, where, where to start or how to find myself here. Um, and that was something that it was very important to me to try to put that across from her because of course that was a completely different experience for me i've lived here before i have friends here um, my best friend was living here i had a place to come immediately when i moved i was you know comparatively comfortable so i really wanted to create a, a, a reality for her that was much more complicated and probably a lot more interesting to read about <laughs> You never know. It's just different. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and one that comes across both for Phoebe and for Hannah that, you know, Phoebe is coming with, you know, a little bit of money in her, in her bag, a little bit sewed into, you know, the inside of her coat, just in case things don't yeah. go well, versus, you know, Hannah's moving over a very well to do woman. And yet there's still this feeling of separateness, like her daughter ends up having a different accent than hers. And, they mm -hmm. they relate to the slang and you know completely differently and and that's so true i didn't think about how you know we watch so much british television these days the accent doesn't seem so foreign to an american ear how did you connect to that feeling of loneliness because what i seem to find is when i'm working on a project like this or people i know are working on a project we end up putting ourselves in situations where we end up feeling kind of horrible in the right way to to write it yeah. so i'm wondering if you have a better strategy than, uh, than that sort of thing, which is often unconscious, I find, at least for myself, until I say, wait a minute, I'm emotionally <laughs> researching that book. Um, how did you get into that well, feeling? I did a lot of reading of the memoirs of The Blacklist. And so uh, um, Norma Barzon, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, wrote this book with the best title ever, The Red and the Blacklist. Um mm. And so she was one of the, she actually did write a script for Hannah. And um, she spoke of that, that even with having a community of other blacklistees in London, there, there were just these feelings of loneliness, of just being out of touch. On the one hand, loving a lot of the life and feeling, feeling good, feeling free. And yet at the same time, you know, just what you miss about home. Um, and because even though they ended up living in Europe a long time, it wasn't home. Um, and, you know, whereas, you know, for me, I actually feel much more at home here than in the States. And that's me. You know, everyone's so different. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you have a different experience as well. But, you know, I certainly looked at so uh, my best friend had moved rather unexpectedly um, just be because her, her husband got a job here. And 
you know, certainly she, once her, her daughter started going to school, you know, she talked about, well, you know, yeah, my, my daughter is, is British and I'm not. And, you know, it just, it, I, I just, you know, it's not bad. It's not good. It's, but it is different and it's not what she expected. You know, it's not, it's not the life she expected to have to, to have. And, you know, she was, delighted with it in a lot of ways but also just you know hearing her daughter talk to her friends just say wow you know it's just in many ways it is a different language and those were some of the little things I was thinking about and just yeah you know this would these are just the things that would mark a person's existence day in day out whilst they're also just trying to navigate life in general yeah I think, yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, parents and children often speak a different language and this would just exaggerate that experience to have, you know, different accent, different slang, different, different everything could be possible. No, completely, completely. And of course, at that time, it would have been even more different than it is now. You know, wholly different media, different books, different songs. Yeah, it's fascinating. So, yeah, yeah. So how much how much pressure do you put on yourself as a, you you used a lovely phrase before we started recording of a, a recovering historian? Um, <laughs> what is it like to to bring that background? You know, how much of your historical historian self do you bring to the novel writing process and how much of it do you have to hold back in order to get on with with telling a story? Oh, the struggle is real. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm suddenly uh, blanking on his his name, but the writer uh, who wrote Frost Nixon and the Queen, mm. um, I, I I went to uh, a lecture by him once, and he said, you know, he writes the story first and then does the research afterward. And I thought, good on you, man. I could not possibly <laughs> imagine. Um, it's difficult because, of course, I yeah yes as a recovering historian, I do like being as accurate as possible. Um, I don't want to overload people with detail. I, you know, I, I, I recognize there are some people who, who love, you know, like, oh, and you know, this dress was cut this way. And, you know, and of course, the, the room would have had this quality about the walls because of cigarette stain, you know, cigarette smoke staining or st something like that. And there are other people who are just, oh, for heaven's sakes, just tell the bloody story already. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm someone who likes both as a reader, but, but also, you know, I want, so I want to do two things. I want to you know, set um, an emotional mood, but then with dealing with things like the politics of the blacklist and the reality of, um, all that went on with the House on American Activities Committee and 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 people fleeing abroad um, or and coming back. Of course, it was you know, paramount that I get this as exact as I possibly could. And what became interesting, especially as I was reading so many memoirs, was discovering so many contradictions, which, of course, mm. is how historiography works. I mean, you know, this is why you can have you know, new discoveries about, uh, you know, say, the medieval era, you know, even though people have been uh, you know, writing medieval history since, what, the 19th century. Um, you know, it, 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 it is because, you know, as you comb over records, you see contradictions. And so you have to begin to interpret things differently. So, you know, so like vis-a-vis -vis Hannah, uh, I read in one one recollection of her that she started Sapphire Films, um, which is the production company that she had here in the UK, with a divorce settlement. Um, but then another source said, no, in fact, it was the Communist Party that you know, gave her the money to set that up. Um, and, and then you know, there was like so something else that, oh, no, it became for this. Like, oh, OK. So even fairly recent history like that, yeah, you're going to have these contradictions. And, you know, look, at the end of the day, I am writing fiction. Um, you know, I, this is not for, you know, thank heavens, it's not for a thesis. Those days are long gone. Uh, don't, don't miss that. Um, 
you know, that was where it became, okay, what feels the most right for the story I want to tell? And so I ended up going a slightly different direction altogether. And, you know, that, and, and ultimately that felt very effective. Um, but yes, you know, it's, it's, it's always this tricky balance with, you know, I do, I do still want to be a good historian and a good teller of history because you know, one of the reasons I'm so drawn to historical fiction is I feel like it does provide a prism, you know, through which we can see ourselves. Uh, and I have very mixed feelings. I mean, you know, part of me thinks, ooh. Now, that's kind of fun. Mostly I'm just appalled when people are referring to the book as being so timely, uh, particularly as, you know, I started a couple of years ago and I sort of thought, oh, well, you know, hopefully things won't seem too bad. Like, no, no, they they really do. I mean, only just uh, I think it was this morning or was it yesterday I read in the news that um, New Yorkers were being denied the global entry program and. Really? And like, wow, that this is 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 just feeling more and more on point. Yeah. You know, so as as uncomfortable as I am with that, insofar as you know me here in the present, it is of course my hope that anyone who reads this um, will be you know hopefully inspired, but also see okay, well you know we have been here before. So what are some of the techniques we can use? What 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 can we take from the past that we can then apply to the present? Oh, and also what can we hopefully do to prevent things from getting yet worse? You know, because yeah, yeah, it's, we it's don't an amazing thing, really want it? to live in a society where citizens are being openly persecuted by the government. And of course, look, to a certain extent, obviously that's always existed. And you know, I even recognize that the bulk of the people I write about um, are the more privileged people. Nonetheless, I'm I'm I am hopeful that there is you no, know, not that I wrote it as a polemic. Uh, that would be boring, but I I, I I I am hopeful that people might be able to take something from it that they that that excuse me that they can then apply. Uh, to our present circumstance. I think that's the most interesting part about history is looking at, you know, what has changed and and what hasn't and and what is sort of cyclical. What do we keep coming mm-hmm. back to and how? Absolutely. We, I don't know if we think about one of these movies where the same scene happens over and over again and how can we how can we change it? I mean, we're in February, so we've got Groundhog Day to think <laughs> about. You know, these situations where. You have all these opportunities to to meet the same situation, and how can we do it better? I think that's one of the best lessons of history in many ways. Oh, absolutely. And th- there certainly is you know the point a lot of people make that, yeah, you know, most of the time we we just do it differently, not better, just differently. Okay, well, you know, thanks for playing. <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> Yeah, we get we get new stories out of it, and then we see what mm-hmm. happens. How much material was there about Hannah? I was really interested in the actual material you used to kind of get at her life, because from what I understand, Phoebe was sort of a composite of of the people you thought were living then. So you wouldn't have been able to research Phoebe, just maybe people in her position. Mm-hmm. But in terms of Hannah, so correct me if I'm wrong there, but. Uh, le- what was the process like researching Hannah specifically? Was it mainly memoirs by other people? Did she write material about her own life? What kind of source material she, were you drawing from? She did from? not. Um, I, I I first, yeah, so I first came across her in uh, I, one of the memoirs. Um, I believe it was Norma Barson. And she was talking about yeah, there was this woman who started this television show and hired a lot of blacklisted writers. And so I started digging into that. And uh, that's when I found an article about the adventures of Robin Hood. That was the show that Hannah started. And she had hired uh, Ring Lardner Jr., who is one of the Hollywood 10. And he I don't know how well known he is today. Uh, in his day, he was hugely famous. He'd won an Oscar for uh, the Woman of the Year. 
Um, and he wrote a number of other well-considered scripts. And he's he's rather famous um, for his testimony before um, the HUAC hearings where they asked him to name names. And he said, well, I could answer the way you'd want, but I'd hate myself in the morning. And it's so just great. such a wonderful line. <laughs> So he was the chief writer for Robin Hood. And and of course, he wrote, I don't know how many scripts for her, but all under, under a different name. Because, of course, everyone who wrote a script had to use a pseudonym. So there were a few people who wrote about her. And some people were very critical of her because they felt you know, she didn't pay very well. You know, she only paid scale. And of course, a lot of these people, you know, serious professionals had been working for quite a bit more money for such a long time. And there were others who said, yes, but look at the tremendous risk she was taking. And, you know, she had to save money for potential legal fees. Um, you know, unfortunately, it, it never did come to that. But indeed, it very well could have. Um, so, I, I was su sort of surprised at how little I could find on her, you know, considering how important she was. Um, but uh, funny enough, as, as I started reading more and finding more, I sort of made the decision to stop. And mm. instead, beca because the Hannah that I was developing was taking such strong root in my head and in the work that I thought, OK, it's. It's time to just let this Hannah be on the page, well, particularly as I was finding more contradictory information. Um, I, I just didn't want to get confused, you know, because then I thought mm, the character is not going to pop on the page then the way I want her to. Now, again, it is fiction and it was more important to me to be accurate to the feelings the emotional life of a person and the period and the experience rather than this actual person as much as I deeply respect and admire her. But like, no, this is a different Hannah and I, I need to just allow my process to take me in that direction and not not question it too much. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes perfect sense because I always think about the difference between kind of factual truth mm -hmm. and emotional truth and that you can learn as much and have as much of a meaningful experience from a book if you feel like what an experience felt like rather than there being a list of, of details that could all be checked off if you fact checked them. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny you say because I often get emails from readers who say, oh, you know, I, I, I loved your book. I couldn't put it down. But, you know, here on page 223 in the third paragraph, you know, you, you, you made this mistake. This was actually an event that happened two years later. And I just think, all right, <laughs> calm down. Now, in point right. of fact, I, I, I appreciate those comments. I really do. Because, look, I appreciate people reading my work and and I love that they love it enough to care. You know, in fact, they notice something amiss. Um, it's just that it's also so, so frustrating to think, oh, good heavens, how much research did I do? How much revision? <laughs> I have a wonderful copy editor and yet, you know, it just... It, it just that's when you know, the so-called historian in me says, ah, oh, you just really whiffed it there. <laughs> oh, well, I, it's so and then I just have to throw up my hands and say, well, you know, there's nothing I can do. Exactly. I think it's also like, what's the goal? You know, do, is it is it better to have a book that someone couldn't put down and that they were really invested in, as you said, and that they care enough to notice this sort of thing or to have one that's perfectly factually accurate? Every little, you know, I dotted and T mm -hmm. crossed, but then maybe doesn't have as much sizzle to it. Oh, well, completely. <laughs> yeah, we we both know what we would take. Um, <laughs> no. And after all, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And 
of course, you know, we would all like to be able to put something out, you know, with absolutely no mistakes. But you know, even Margaret Atwood said once, oh, I, I don't think I've got a single book that doesn't have one error in it somewhere. Exactly. She's even confessed, speaking of Margaret Atwood, this was absolutely fascinating to me, that it was her readers that figured out the character's real name was June, and that it wasn't her, and that she'd just written this list and didn't notice that she mentioned all of them except June at other places in the book, which I totally oh, loved. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, I, now that you say that, I do remember reading that when, when the television series began, because that was how they determined what the character's name ought to be. It's, you know, and, and this is the joy of writing. I mean, you know this, that as as it starts, you know, as much work as we do at the beginning, it does start taking on a life of its own. And there are things that then can surprise us in our own work. Um, you know, one of the things that always is so thrilling to me is when I hear from a reader who has a take on something, particularly in a character's emotional life, that I, I, I just hadn't realized. Just, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that was just something that ended up happening. And that's, to me, that's the beauty of revision is, you know, because initially in that first draft, well, actually, no, I, I'm going to, you know, contradict myself. So the first draft, you know, is, yes, the, <laughs> the, the shitty vomit first draft and, you know, you're just getting everything out there. And then the second you start to be you know, more meticulous, you're trying to clean things up, you're organizing, I, I get very fussy with my organization. But then somewhere in the third draft, then then everything is in place. And once people are more locked down, like once, like, yes, this is when this scene is happening. That's when it all starts to really take off and have more of a life of its own. And, you know, things go into the relationships change and, you know, the the physical arc is laid out, but the emotional arc, you know, becomes becomes flesh and, you know, just goes in its in its own direction. And that's when I can really feel very free to just just follow it. Yeah, and that, that, that becomes sort of the most joyful part. Then, of course, we get to, you know, about the sixth revision and then it's <laughs> then off. you're completely exhausted. It's like that middle bit. Yeah, it's like you've decided when everything's going to happen, what the basic plot line is, the thing, decisions have been made, I guess we would say. And mm -hmm. was there anything in particular in Red Letter Days that changed during that third draft? Or what, what was an emotional experience? Can you think of an example? I realize this is a horrible question because you're, <laughs> you're far away from it now, so I do apologize. But if you, can you think of an example of something where the, the sort of emotional part was particularly joyful to play with in, say, the third draft? Well, there is a major set piece at about the halfway point um, where based on a real incident where the gossip columnist Hedda Hopper, who was a notorious red baiter, um, in, in, she, and she was in uh, Hollywood, and she did come to England specifically to look for, um, well, she was looking for directors working, blacklisted directors working on films that were slated for American distribution. Um, because anyone whom she could uncover, of course, then the film would lose its distribution and, you know, the, the producers would likely have a very hard time getting work after that or certainly work connected with Hollywood. She was delightful. It's, um, just, it's just who does that? That's their that's their <laughs> hobby. It's just it's just atrocious. Oh, and she enjoyed it. I mean, that's oh, I'm sure she did. <laughs> no, that's that's the part that's just so I mean it makes her fun to write as a character but totally. good heavens but I I must have rewritten that scene oh so many times I can't even remember but yes so it did change because Hannah is very tangentially um, involved in the scene towards the beginning and and she has a conversation with a very minor character. And initially it was, Hannah was much more um, frightened. 
as she would be, of course, because you know she 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 wouldn't want she was she was running you know the hottest game in town. You know, everybody was blacklisted, right? But as I was rewriting it, it was this was actually very late. Um, I mean, this was after you know, my my editor had read it. We we were, we were nearly in copy edits, and uh, I realized you know, something is just not working here. And and without getting too too into specifics, I, I I just saw what it was, and it was something about Hannah's demeanor and her interaction with the person she was talking to. I realized no, she would come at this from a completely different direction, because whatever she was feeling she would not allow to be seen uh. quite as clearly as it was potentially being seen and and yeah so i ended up making quite a quite a large revision to it really very late in the day um and you know, fortunately look i've got such a wonderful editor and you know because initially she's like no 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 it's 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 good as it is and i said well wait but but look at this and and she said she saw the revision and she said oh well now it's perfect <laughs> <laughs> so yeah you know it's it it is just amazing the things you can realize quite late and this was also after i had stepped away from it for a longer period of time i mean i'd been in this story for you know two in some years and you know to finally sort of take a break from it and I had done some traveling and I was in this lovely new relationship and you know really for the first time getting to feel my life in London where I wasn't working all the time um so yes then coming back to the book you know after the editor had been through it it, it 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 was a very different emotional experience. It was delightful until, of course, the copy edits, and then it was hell all over again. But, you know, <laughs> in a good way. We take the good with the bad. We do. We don't have a choice, really. No, it's it's got to come out in the end. But Indeed. That's really helpful to know. Um, it's been such a treat talking to you, and I enjoyed oh, this book great. as well as your first book so much. So... Really Thank lovely you. to talk about what happened behind the scenes to to make both of them happen. Thank you. It's it, this has just been wonderful. Thank you so much for listening to the Secret Library podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. You can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. See you next week. Until then, happy writing.